All right, special lesson for you today. I want to prove this proof of the power rule, and I think that this one is worth watching and understanding. Uh, unlikely to show up on any kind of a test, but there's a lot of neat things here, and, and if you like math even a little bit, I think this is, this is pretty darn neat. Um, we will, in fact, prove this again when we have implicit differentiation, but this proof deserves being shown. So uh, let's go on a, on a little tangent here. It, you may have learned at some point how to take higher powers. So a plus b to the n. What does this equal? Okay, so a plus b to the 1 is equal to a plus b. a plus b squared is equal to a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. a plus b cubed is equal, equal to a cubed plus 3ab, uh, so a squared b plus 3ab squared plus b cubed. So you notice the pattern on the exponents that the power on the a is going 3, 2, 1, 0, and the power on the b is going 0, 1, 2, 3. And uh, once you realize that, that this is going to describe all the possible combinations of a's and b's, the question becomes, what are these coefficients? How would I know what those coefficients are? And there's a nice pattern for this um, that I'm going to maybe remind you of. Uh, it goes a little bit like this. If I write down these coefficients, um, I should include 0 as well. So if, if a plus b to the 0 is just a, a 1, and then it looks like I get a, a 1 and a 1 for this first case here. And then it looks like I get a 1 and a 2 and a 1 for that uh, squared case. And then I get a 1 and a 3 and a 3 and a 1. And some of you right now are saying, I know what this is. Uh, some of you else are not. It turns out you're always going to start with a 1. You're always going to end with a 1. Because there is exactly one way when I'm foiling this out over and over again. And you can do this just by. Um, by basically repeated foiling if you really, really want to, or really just distributing over and over again, um, there's only one way you're going to get a's each time, to get this a cubed, a times a times a. And we're saying, all right, as we're going across three copies of a plus b, we're picking out some combination of a's and b's, and there's only one way to get all a's. But there's three ways that I could get two a's and one b. Um, so I'll even draw this out, just because I think this is worth seeing. A little trouble with that. Okay, so here's a plus b cubed, and every factor comes from some way of picking an a and a b from each of these. So I could go a, a, b, and that's one way to get a squared b. But I could have gone, uh, I could have gone a, b, a, or I could have gone b, a, a, and there were three ways of getting. A beautiful picture, two a's and a b. And that's where this is this is really coming from, is when I'm doing this double distribution. Okay, so there's only one way to get three a's, there's only one way to get three b's, and then there's lots of other ways to get the numbers in the middle. And for four, this is going to be four, uh, this is going to be a six, and this is going to be a four, and maybe you see the pattern by now or you've seen it before. Um, the pattern is that you just take the two numbers kitty corner above and add them up. Uh, one, one plus four is five, four plus six is 10, six plus four is 10, four plus one is five, one plus zero is one. This whole thing has a name, it's called Pascal's Triangle. Thank you, Pascal. Okay. There is actually a formula for each of these numbers as well. I'll write it down real quick, but I'm not gonna delve on it. Uh, it's n choose k, which is equal to uh, equal to n factorial over k factorial times n minus k factorial.
factorial. For those of you who want to look a little deeper, there are nice formulas for each of these, but the triangle will do us just fine for now. And there's two things I need you to notice about this triangle. One is that it's all ones here. And two is that the next row in goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so this, this column in here is just n, right? I go one, two, three, and then it'd be four and a five. So, so the coefficient on this next term is just whatever that n is, whatever that power is. Neat. All right, little reminder on how those big powers work. Now let's see why on earth I need them. So I'm going to do it. Let's go ahead and take the derivative of x to the n. This, we have to appeal to the definition. The definition says take h to 0 of x plus h to the n minus x to the n all over h. It's just the definition of a derivative. You should be able to do this as well. Next up, I need somehow to simplify this. Luckily for me, I know what this looks like. Pascal's triangle tells me what this looks like. So let's go ahead and write this out again. The limit as h goes to 0 of um, x to the n is the first term, plus the coefficient on the next term is n x n minus 1 times h plus a whole bunch of other stuff with higher powers of h uh, minus x to the n. So I'm going to ignore the entire rest of this polynomial for a moment. What you need to know is that it has powers of h that are at least 2. Right? All these have higher powers of h. Um, this x to the n and this x to the n are going to go away. It would help if I finished this off and said this is all over h. Okay. Um, and now, now I can cancel out these h's. So this goes to, uh, looks like n times x to the n minus 1. These h's are going to cancel. Plus, these have higher powers of h. So this is going to be h to the h times some big stuff. Uh, when we let this h go to 0, what happens? This whole term goes away. What are we left with? n times x to the n minus 1. And that's it. Pretty neat.